Hi, I'm Mark, producer of Roundtable, the TV series born here in New York City at the legendary Manhattan Neighborhood Network Studios. The exchange of ideas is important, and that is why we bring to you the following presentation. Please watch. Welcome to Single Shot Show at Manhattan Neighborhoods Network. For recent uh, few episodes, we was focusing on uh, art side of photography. We was discussing the artistic part of it. We was discussing succeeding as a photographic artist. And uh, this time we decided to go in a completely different direction and uh, discuss uh, the commercial side of photography, the practical applications of uh, our media that shaping this world in so many ways from uh, selling products to creating personal portraits of people and uh, with emergence of uh, high quality smartphone cameras and uh, with uh, the abundance of uh, tutorial videos that one can watch a lot of people started to think that this part of photography can be done just by about anyone and without any effort so to discuss it and uh, to see what part of it is true and what part of it is not we uh, invited Single Shot's all-time friend Ian Clifford. Hello Ian and Hi. thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for having me back Alex and uh, Happy New Year to you. Happy New Year to you as well and uh, let's talk about it. Let's see is it really enough to have an iPhone and YouTube video in order to create something that actually would sell or would be worthy of putting on the wall as a family photo? Well there's two sides of the coin. Um, for a lot of people that are creating uh, content that is specifically for the web, uh, YouTube and uh, Instagram, various things like this. The iPhone um, is a formidable uh, device for, I mean, it, it shoots 4K video, um, it shoots uh, 12 megapixel images um, with the latest uh, um, uh, iteration of the iPhone. It has actually three lenses. Um, so it's a very formidable device as long as you're talking about something that won't be blown up larger than, um, was it, 1920 by 1080. That's the one. Um, and it goes back to what we were discussing uh, the time before, which is all the equipment in the world won't save you or break you unless you have a compelling story. Cool. And um, so... The whatever device that you have in your hands, and I've heard it said that the best camera in the world is the one that you have in your hands, That's for sure. um, won't, um, is not going to enrich your ability to tell a story. And um, storytelling, whether it be commercial photography or fine art photography, is still grounded in storytelling. And it's kind of funny, like, I can be on a photo shoot and shoot 400 images and maybe I'll get a hundred that are acceptable that I would pass off as what I want to, uh, you know, to give to the client. And then there'll be four or five that are really, really great examples of the kind of work that I'm trying to do. But there'll always be one that kind of sums up the story of what I was trying to capture and help collaboratively birth with the client so um, I don't know I think that um, cameras are insignificant um, compared to the story now the other side of that coin is in certain situations such as low light or um, you know, um, various uh, environmental type situations you are going to need a camera, especially if it's going to be on something bigger than a ca on a ca uh, seen on a phone, 
that can capture uh, the essence of what it is you're trying to do and give you the clarity and smoothness and, and uh, you know, um, quality of an image that you're not going to get necessarily with a smartphone and you're not going to get with somebody who has a very limited understanding of what they're doing. Well, I would say that uh, the last phrase you said is exactly what uh, we could be focusing on talking about the subject, understanding of what you're doing. Yeah. Uh, you can have the most expensive equipment, you can have uh, even those tutorials, but it's still uh, rooted in the experience and understanding of what you're trying to do. And uh, sometimes it's not only about the te technical side of it. I've seen uh, numerous photos and uh, that would include a lot of photographs for commercial use, like say ads on social media sure, sure. that uh, are done flawlessly in terms of uh, the formal side. They correctly written, they have the proper body book composition, but they're still not doing the job. Uh, one of the examples of what we was discussing in this is uh, approach to displaying clothing. Every company is different, every company and every brand is in different situation. So when clothing is photographed for a specific brand, a lot of things have to be taken in uh, account. Just to name a few is uh, one of them is uh, how prominent and how recognized the brand is, whether you need to focus on a specific product or on making sure people understand that this is the product of this company. In, f in some cases, uh, photographing of the item alone is the ideal uh, approach. In other cases, uh, without having a proper selected model in a proper setup, it wouldn't be uh, the right thing to do. I would probably hand over this thought to you because you have much more experience in doing this than I do. Well, breathing, um, what it really becom becomes is, with pr especially with product photography or branded product, product photography, is you're trying to breathe life into the article, whether that's, um, you know, uh, photographing um, or um, shooting video of uh, a model wearing the clothes or the handbag or the garment or the the jewelry um, you're trying to tell the story in a compelling way that engages the audience the buyer the and 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 client with um, an experience that they can bond with on an emotional and psychological level um, you know it's really easy to um, see it when you're looking at a Louis Vuitton bag, right? Naturally. Um, but, uh, you know, so certain items have a lot more subtlety, especially if it's like a custom-made jewelry type situation. And, um, but one thing that holds true across the board is telling a compelling, engaging story that allows the experiencer, the person that's viewing this, to form some type of a relationship with the product. And um, in order to do that, um, you know, and, and it's really funny because you can have the perfect setup, you can have the perfect lighting, but it's actually anticipating the moment that the person who experiences the end result goes through when they see your work. I mean, if you, um, it's two degrees this way or two degrees that way, it's finding and accessing that moment and then with the client, whoever's hired you to do this work, being able to birth co-collaboratively that inextricable moment where the buyer, the, uh, the, the client, the, 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 the end user is able to connect in such a way that you're able to form brand loyalty it's magic, it um, and and you know the the thing is you, you can study that you can study that in school, and you know you can have a very uh, concrete understanding of the, the the means necessary to achieve that, but the only way that you're going to really be able to effectively perform this type of work is by form forming an understanding of it through years of uh, doing it, mm -hmm. and because the, like there's certain things that you know, you've heard of muscle memory with your equipment Absolutely, and things like this, yes. but there's certain things that just can't be arrived at through any other method than the experiential, uh, you know, uh, investment 
in the time it takes to form those understandings. And it's Absolutely. not just composition. Actually, I'll tell you, um, it's something more than this. It's about almost, it's like time travel. You have to be able to anticipate things before they happen and have a vision of it. And I don't, I can't exactly explain to you how it happens, but I can explain to you that I know when it's going to happen. That all of these things come together in such a way that you have a moment of clarity. And in that moment, you're able to communicate a story through the image. That's uh, the best I can well, explain. Well, uh, that actually is a very compelling explanation. And that actually reminds me of this uh, trend that we witnessed a lot actually in 2019. It started a little before, but it became to be very apparent that uh, a lot of uh, high-level brands, especially in their social media uh, promotional campaigns, using professional photographers with lots of experience, but uh, asking them to create images that would look like uh, unprofessional images right. with all the experience behind them. Well, there's, that's the element, is to bring some grit. Something that people can relate to, something that they would think they it's can actually take themselves, but probably they still would be wrong. We'll get, we'll get back to this after the break. Okay. No, going well. about the least quantifiable quantity of the lens I will be talking a lot about it and that would be uh, the lens character it's a combination of uh, lens optics the way they made the way they coat it its properties uh, based on its focal length and everything else which makes every lens to have a unique way it interprets the image in order to show you the difference I brought three lenses that uh, all the same focal length, 135 millimeters, made for the same kind of camera and uh, at the same time period. They're made by Leica, Zeiss and Schneider. So I will just take a picture with all three of them and you will be able to see the difference uh, yourself. And that's pretty much what lens character is. Alright, we're back and uh, we were talking about uh, viewers of the commercial uh, photography relating to the photography and basically in a way thinking that yeah, I can do it with my phone. And uh, that actually brings us to another very interesting phenomenon which is related to people photographing themselves, their relatives and uh, in general using their phones to make their own and their family's pictures they actually taking those pictures looking at them and uh, they do realize that something is amiss and i know that you did extensive work with uh, this type of photography oh, yeah. so uh would you care to well, explain in simple what's what exactly is amiss in those I'll images tell you, i'll tell you what what's an interesting um uh recently i had the um, opportunity to photograph a hasidic family mm -hmm. of 15 people that's a big family. Some children, very young children, um, all the way up uh, to the grandmother and the grandfather. And um, I was able to get an exposure where everybody's smiling and looking at the camera. No Photoshop. No Photoshop. You're a magician. Well, that's the thing, you know, and, it's, and, and, and to be able to command the attention of, the view, uh, of, of whoever you're photographing, the viewer, um, the sitter and do it in such a way that um, you're helping them to create this image for posterity. And so with 16 people, 
in uh, several different um, ways you're communicating the importance of what you're doing like you know to try to explain to a little kid in 20 years you'll look at this picture you know and this will this is your life this is this is this is a, 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 this is a moment and that as a photographer I'm sharing a moment with this family and I am able to capture 16 people looking at me and smiling at the same time because I'm communicating in many different levels in many different ways to everybody in the room this is what we're doing and it's important yeah. and for me like this is the thing I love to do that for families for individuals for for people um, I love to capture their experience for posterity because you know, it's it, photography, like we've talked about before. This is, in a sense, time travel. And you're able, through the image, to go back in time to a place that doesn't exist anymore. Absolutely. But the nowness of the capture, the moment of capture, is something that you have to communicate to everybody. And it's funny, like, when you approach it from that way, that it's a co-collaborative birthing of a piece of media that will allow you to travel back in time. People work with you. People get that. And sometimes it's even an unspoken thing. It's just an energy in the room that I love what I'm doing and I want to give you something. People respond to that. It's almost, uh, dare I say, a spiritual thing that when you're in the right moment and you're trying to do something to the best of your ability, given the circumstances at hand, people respond to that. And, um, you know, for, for me, uh, any type of a photography job is something that I go to with joy, go with joy to my work, because I get to do what I love and get a check out of it, get to get, to get paid. Well, that's the best setup you can come up with, absolutely. It's, it'll keep you young, you know? Average. You know, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, the idea of doing something that you thoroughly enjoy for people and they see that it has value and you know that it has value it gives you a sense of purpose and worth and meaning to your life that I don't know how I, how I would get any other way mm -hmm. and um, with regard to what you were saying about you know the the ubiquitous phone camera and da, 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 I think that it's wonderful that everybody is able to capture their moments, but not all moments are given the same weight in hindsight. Hindsight's twenty twenty, right? Yes. Not all moments are given the same weight because not everyone is able to bring to the media the level of expertise necessary to create, instead of a snapshot, a portrait. Mm. Actually, uh, from several photographers who are working with uh, formal portraits in one way or another, I've heard a very interesting uh, rationale about what recently was changing in terms of how the clients actually interacting with them and with the camera. While uh, years back, what was happening, uh, clients was a little bit overestimating the gravity of the moment they was feeling the importance of this moment is overwhelming and uh, they would pretty much be stiffs not as my not much different in the amount of animation from those spooky Victorian portraits of the dead people they would actually try to be somebody they not just because they would think oh it's so big and so important I can't really uh, screw it up and now people taking so many pictures of themselves themselves that it's hard for them to conceive that there is a gravity there is a historical and archival content attached to this particular moment and to focus on this photograph enough to actually act in a way yeah. actually be the best themselves yeah. but yeah. best of themselves well it's funny you know like uh, one of my favorite portrait photographers I would have to say is Arnold Newman mm -hmm. And what I really love about his work was the way he was able to capture the subject in an environment that told a story about the subject itself. And um, I find that, um, you know, I get, I, I, w what you're talking about, the other side of the, the coin is that I get a thing called imposter syndrome mm -hmm. before I go to photo shoots. I always get it. And in one sense, it's good because it makes me remember everything that I need to. Oh, do I have those batteries? Do I have, the, what, uh, do I have this light? And do I have this diffuser? And then it, but 
I always have this feeling before a shoot that I'm doing I'm doing something wrong, or I don't know this or that, or I'm, I'm underestimating this. Or, but it's good because um, when the shoot starts, it disappears. But just before that, I'm all questions to myself. What am I doing? What you know? And I'm, and I'm always second guessing myself. But I think in a way it's good, and also it keeps it fresh for me because it, I, I say to myself. What's missing here? What haven't I thought of? Mm -hmm. And and this will go back to before I ever do a shoot, I always call the sitter, the client, and I say, I just want to go over the shoot with you very briefly. And I you know, and I get a little feedback about how many people there are gonna be, what 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 the situation is, what the context is, and you know, how many changes of outfits there are, what what's the lighting situation as far as they can see it. And um it's good for me because it forms a relationship with the client before I see them, even the timbre of their voice, the tone in their voice. And this is how I start to get visions before the shoot of what might happen, what could happen, what are the possibilities. What's the character here that I'm trying to capture? What is the... And I think it's really important that, um, you know, you never get too sure of yourself. You're always questioning, how can I do this better? How can I refine this? How can I make something that I couldn't make yesterday? Oh, and uh, in my understanding, the more proficient you are in any field, especially yeah. if it's a creative field, yeah. the more of those concerns yeah. would be uh, on your mind just because you are aware of uh, the size and gravity of uh, things that need to be taken care of in order to make sure that everything yeah go smoothly and uh, ends up exactly where it needs to uh, go. I mean, I know on some level it's irrational, but uh, I still try to find holes in my visual argument, you know, before the shoot. Well, uh, as I said, I do believe it's actually a sign of uh, knowing everything there is to know about this oh, close, uh, particular right? thing. Oh, at least close. We'll get back to this after the break. Today in single shot I'm going to tell you how to make a makeshift pinhole camera. It's actually very simple. All you need is a business card. I'm gonna use mine but you can use any. You need to apply two pieces of duct tape on it, just like this, so they will be overlapping each other. And right in the middle of the cut, from the inside, pierce a small hole. The smaller and rounder it is, the better will be your result. And put this contraption right on the camera, so uh, the hole is right in the middle of the lens space. Then point it at what you would like to take a picture of, put the camera on delay, and take the shot. Voila! You have your pinhole camera shot. Thank you and watch us on YouTube. Alrighty, we're back and uh, during the break I was actually talking about uh, people missing a lot of opportunities for their businesses when they don't understand the value of uh, proper and high quality photography for what they're trying to offer to the public. So yeah. Well, I mean I've had a lot of experience with clients that um, through either catalog work or uh, advertising that um, Especially in this day and age where there are a majority of people are selling things online. And um, it's given a secondary consideration, even though, to me, that's the core principle to sell 
their wares to, to the consumer. And um, to me, this makes very little sense. Uh, it's actually uh, counterintuitive uh, in terms of uh, business because, you know, you've heard the saying, the eyes eat the food. Yes. Well, if the eyes eat the food, the eyes are also eating the, the pair of pants uh, or the sweater online. Or the car. Or the ring or the watch or the... And I find it amazing how so many people in retail really underestimate the power of photography or, or video to help them as a conduit to sell their products. Yeah, that's especially amazing uh, when it comes to high value products like Jubilee, for example. I know that you have quite an interesting story about uh, Jubilee photography. Yeah, I, I had a client that um, was uh, mainly selling their, uh, their jewelry on, uh, which is custom jewelry, on their website and on Etsy and a few other um, uh, you know outlets. outlets. But um, they weren't really giving uh, proper uh, credence to the understanding of the medium, you know, that macro uh, lenses needed to be employed because of jewelry Natural. and uh, good neutral lighting and, um, you know, uh, various means of post-processing such as uh, focus stacking. Mm -hmm. Where you take a, uh, you know, some macro images of at various different focal lengths of an image, and then sandwich those together in post processing in Photoshop. And what this does is produces an image, if done properly, that gives you a totally sharp focus from the back of the item to the front of the item, crystal clarity. And with jewelry, especially, this is something that you want. Um, so I was able to help them uh, gain a greater understanding and also increase sales by, you know, the eyes eat the food. The better eyes eat the good, food. Better take good pictures of whatever you're selling. And um, if you can't do it, entrust that role to somebody who can, you know, has, a, has a proven record of being able to do so. Excellent. Well, let's make 2020 a year of good pictures of everything taken. For sure. <laughs> Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. And Thank you. found that worth watching as much as I did. I'm Mark for Roundtable. Thanks for watching. See you next week. Bye.